Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Monday, October 16th, 2023. In just a moment, the former British diplomat and our big brain guest, Alistair Crook, joins us, and I will ask him, can diplomacy possibly save the Middle East? But first this. Can you believe the chaos confronting Americans today? The government is out of control. Debt is out of control. And have you heard? The dollar is under attack. This will soon be replaced by digital currency. No more paper cash. It's coming fast. So you need to get educated in other ways to protect and preserve the wealth you already have. What happens if the government destroys the United States dollar? I don't know. But I do know they can't destroy gold or silver or the value of it. That's why it's so important that you learn now how to transfer your wealth into gold and silver. So educate yourself about investing in precious metals. Take charge of your retirement with gold-backed IRAs, and you can transfer a portion of your existing IRAs tax and penalty-free. So don't procrastinate. Take control. Do the right thing for you and your family. Go to LearJudgeNap.com or call 800-511-4620. Alistair, welcome back uh, to the program, as always. Um, You have a career of uh, personal experience Uh, in diplomacy. As we speak, the American Secretary of State is bouncing all over the (laughs) Middle East, taking the the pulse of Middle East uh, leaders and seeing what he can negotiate. Can diplomacy possibly stop the conflagration between Hamas and Israel? You know, I, I, I always used to tell Solana, who was the high representative of the European Union, when he asked me to try and see if there's room for a diplomatic initiative or a ceasefire, and I would say, you know, we can't be King King Canute on the beach telling the tide to go out when it's coming in. It just won't happen. So I think if the answer to your question is at the moment, I think an invasion is almost baked in, an invasion of Gaza. Um, the, I, how long it'll last, it, it may be quite a long-term operation in, in Gaza. Um, there will be horrific consequences, both for civilian Palestinians. There already are heavy bombing last night in Gaza, uh, but also for um, uh, the Israelis as well. When that finishes, is there going to be a chance Well, there is some interesting diplomacy just taking shape at the moment, but I don't think it's very much noticed in the mainstream, but it's very, very important, very significant shift taking place. What is the important shift that's taking place as we speak? Uh, China is gathering the Arab states together. China has taken a very strong stance about Palestinian rights and about the Palestinian um, need for humanitarian assistance. And we've had also uh, a very strange, I mean, a very important um, uh, telephone conversation between Raisi, the president of of Iran, and Mohammed bin Salman, um, the uh, crown prince in, in Saudi Arabia. And all the states are coming together in a, in a very strong way. I mean, it's almost reminiscent of the sort of Arab rebellion uh, that took place at the end of the First World War, when the Arabs rebelled against the Ottomans and against the Alliance, the Alliance at that time and overthrew it. It was an armed rebellion. Uh, it won't be so evident to, to, to you in the United States, for those of you in the United States, but there's a huge differential between what is shown on, I think, American television and on the television around the Middle East. And in the United States, very little about actually what the situation in, in Gaza, I believe, is shown. But in the Middle East, it is riveting and it is mobilizing people. And I think there is a sense that when this war comes to an end, uh, then Russia, China, 
Iran, Saudi Arabia, the Arab states are, are, are going to try and push uh, very hard for a diplomatic solution, i.e. a negotiated, acceptable solution for a Palestinian state, something that was never done after 47, uh, despite the uh, UN Resolution 242. Whether this will succeed, we just have to get through the first stage. Politics is not static, it shifts. It's always in a dynamic state. So we don't know where the dynam dynamics will, will go. But at the moment, many Arab states are very anxious about their own stability because of the popular um, unhappiness, popular anger at what they're seeing happening in Gaza uh, to the civilians of Gaza being bombed and the, the uh, Gaza city being completely really destroyed. Well, this morning, or this morning, uh, American time, uh, the Israelis destroyed the Syrian airport in Aleppo and rendered useless the uh, international airport uh, in Damascus. So we're beginning to see already an externality. I mean, violence taking place outside of Israel. Uh, and <laughs> What do you think the Israeli initial goal is here is it to extricate and save the hostages or is it to degrade uh gaza totally and completely well there's a big difference uh when blinken goes around and he talks to people like uh, ben salman he's basically talking about the hostages i mean that's the main american concern the concern of Saudi Arabia and the other stages is the humanitarian situation in Gaza. And they're two <laughs> rather different agendas. Uh, so first of all, um, there's a, a, a completely different agenda. But we know pretty clearly what the Israeli intent is. The first intent is to try and move as many people out of the top if you like, a third of Gaza, push them down to the south. They can't go through to Egypt because Egypt has blocked the Rafa crossing, which is the only crossing into Egypt. They can't go, they can't go across that, but they want them out of the way so that they can, Israel would then, stage two is to level that area. I bomb it down to ground zero and then to put in troops. And they've been mobilizing huge numbers of troops, reverse reservists and uh, others um, for this and assembling tanks and equipment on the border. As we speak now, this large congregation, uh, this could happen at any moment. Um, it seems that Israel is adamant that it must be done. They believe they've got uh, assurances from Western states, even if they're cautioned about human rights and law, um, nonetheless, they feel they have the support of the West to go in and try and kill and exterminate um, the members of Hamas in that area, who are probably sitting well below ground in tunnels and in, um, <coughs> uh, in, in their um, bunkers underneath Gaza. But under international law and common, commonly understood Judeo Christian morality, they can't slaughter innocents, they can't destroy a country uh, in order to attack uh, a terrorist group that has taken over uh, the country, particularly when they know where the terrorist group is. How, how, does Israel, uh, does Prime Minister Netanyahu purport to justify uh, the slaughter of Palestinian innocents because of the slaughter of Israeli innocents? Well, basically, yes. I mean, there is huge support for the bombing of Gaza from the Israeli public. I mean, overwhelming support for that. Um, but yes, uh, <coughs> of course, if you bomb a city like Gaza and, you know, complete apartment blocks have been leveled and uh, have, have um, imploded with families living inside them, um, yes. It's, it's going to cause massive civilian deaths. Already there are massive 
civilian deaths, massive deaths of children um, as a consequence of these bombings. But then we go into the next stage, which will be with the troops on the ground. And I've, as I've said to you before, I think, you know, this urban uh, guerrilla warfare is terrible for troops. It's the most awful thing. How do you tell a friendly face from an enemy face? How do you know where they are? They'll come at you from tunnels. There will be booby traps. Uh, there will be snipers. It's going to be very, very difficult. But nonetheless, it seems, at least right up until before this program, it seems that Israel is determined to go ahead with this project. It's given certain assurances to the United States. The United States has insisted that water be restored in the South, for example. There's talk of a humanitarian corridor coming in, but so far Israel has not agreed to that. And I don't think Hamas has either. Uh, but the main preoccupation of America is hostages. But the main preoccupation of the Arab world is the situation for Gazans as they face more bombing, more leveling uh, of Gaza in preparation for troops going down on the ground. Here's um, uh, Jake Sullivan, the uh, president's national security advisor, cut number two, Chris, on uh, the Israelis know where Hamas is from their intel, and they know where the rockets are coming from. Hamas is a terrorist group, don't get me wrong, but how, how do we know anything about what they're hitting, given the fact that it doesn't sound like any of the intelligence inside Gaza is particularly good? Well, Jake, Israel has known uh, where particular parts of Hamas's terrorist infrastructure have been located. They know, for example, where rockets are fired from, and they can go back to those locations to take out the rocket emplacements. They know from various forms of intelligence collection where certain individuals are located who are senior commanders in Hamas who are part of the bloody and barbaric attacks that took place against Israel last Saturday. Aren't they compelled by international law and Judeo-Christian morality to target offensive weaponry and those who would use it, as opposed to targeting civilians by starving them and, and denying them water, denying them electricity, forcing their hospitals to close? Yes, that is, those are war crimes, simply put. They are clearly war crimes. It's against all the conventions of law, if you like, to knowingly kill civilians knowingly to starve and deprive them of water, of medicine, uh, of electricity, all those things. All the hospitals have stopped because they have no fuel and no electricity. Uh, and of course, it would be widely condemned in other places as a war crime. Will there be consequences when this is over to Prime Minister Netanyahu, either domestically, politically, or internationally as a war, as a defendant in a war criminal prosecution? Uh, I think the latter is probably unlikely because I don't think there's a very great success rate of prosecuting them except in rare instances. I don't know. I mean, there is strong opposition to Netanyahu. There's a feeling that when this is over, when this phase is over, the invasion and what happens. But I just want to remind everyone, because we're talking about this in a, in, in a static way again. I mean, at any point, this, we are teetering at the edge of other fronts, this multi-front war starting against Israel. It's not just simply what's happening in Gaza. Very easily, you talked about what happened in, in Syria. But every day, incrementally, there are further exchanges of fire between Israel and Hezbollah. Hezbollah have taken out all the observation posts, all the radar, all the electronic observation posts in and around uh, the Lebanese border. The Israelis have declared a no-go zone of four kilometers leading up to that area. Um, uh, but Hezbollah is still firing into IDF camps and into their areas, um, uh, more or less as we speak. It's going higher and higher and higher and higher. 
every day it's escalating. So, I mean, we're talking about something quite different then, that if the invasion starts, Hezbollah has said it is a red line, and if this is crossed, then we will um, react. We will open another front. I don't know how. I don't know what they would have in mind. But as you know, they have huge stock of smart cruise missiles, 150,000, um, many, many swarm drugs. Uh, and so I think, yes, we're seeing that. And I think the United States has warned um, the Arab states <coughs> that they will intervene um, um, if, you, if they believe that Syria, they will probably leave Hezbollah to Israel, but they will intervene with the aircraft that they have on the carriers just off the, the coast of Lebanon. They will intervene if uh, Syria uses its S-300s or its other um, surface-to-air uh, systems. That's what the Aleppo and that's what the Damascus bombing was all about. It was to test whether the Russians had given the green light to their S-300s being used. Now, either they haven't given the green light or they've said, wait, because we're not quite at that stage yet when the S-300s can be uh, deployed in the support of Lebanon and the Palestinians of Gaza. How concerned are you about this uh, becoming a major conflagration, whether from the uh, West involving U.S. aircraft carriers, which could be sitting ducks for uh, drones and missiles, uh, or from the East uh, involving Hezbollah supported by uh, Iran? As I say, you know, you can never tell the course that a sort of dynamic war can take. It's impossible to predict <laughs> often small incidents can take you to the next stage. But we're literally at the cusp. And um, at any moment, we might find that um, uh, Israel has invaded, Gaza is bombing it heavily, and Hezbollah has incrementally increased its participation to the point at which it's becoming an actor in this war. What is becoming of the war in Ukraine while uh, the West eyes, and I guess the Middle East eyes, are on uh, Israel and Hamas? The uh, so-called spring offensive, the renamed summer offensive, has absolutely failed. President uh, Zelensky hasn't even heard from these days because the media is fixated uh, on the uh, events in Israel and, uh, and Hamas. Uh, in the meantime, it appears it appears the Russians may actually be moving westward. How much longer can that conflagration even last? And does the U.S. Congress even care about it anymore? Okay, I've asked you a lot of questions all at once. My apology. But no, no, it, it, it's a clear. I mean, the Ukrainian, just to be clear, the Ukrainian offensive has stopped. They've gone on to a defensive mode. They're not doing any offensive offensive operations at all. And the Russians have gone on the offensive. So, yes, they've started their offensive. Not in a big way, but <coughs> across the board. A huge number of casualties still taking place um, for the Ukrainian side. Um, and how long can it go on for? I, I think, you know, effectively, it's over. I mean, the war is over. It's just a question of how it is brought down to uh, rest because I don't think the Ukraine any longer has the material. I mean, that is real troops to continue the war. It's finished. All of those are dead or injured. And they really can't continue the war uh, as it is. And, they, and their money is likely to run out in the next two or three weeks. And, and what will uh, the White House, the West, and NATO say to justify rather than to lament the hundreds of billions of wasted dollars and the millions of dead and displaced lives? I think they just, I mean, very basically, they just hope 
that their influence over the media means that they'll just have moved on. You hardly see anything about Ukraine at the moment. It's sort of gone from the the the, the um, from the news cycle, certainly um, in you know Western journals. And um, I think you know after Kabul, after the retreat from Kabul, um, that also just disappeared from the news. And I think just, they will try and do that. Just disappeared. But last uh, question from your knowledge of the way governments work and the way power is used and the way governments rise and fall. What is your uh, best uh, prediction, for lack of a word, of what becomes of President Zelensky? Uh, um, I imagine he's... Um, I imagine he's going to be moved on somewhere. I mean, he has a house here in Italy, and I expect he'll be moved on very soon. I mean, there are already signs. The U.S. is pressing hard for presidential elections. Um, he's being attacked in the U.S. press, notably, which suggests his time is up and he's gone. He's really going when they find the right way to do that. So I think he he, he he's basically... Uh, on his way out of that. And and I think they'll just try and forget it all. They'll say something pious about how they've succeeded and they've stopped Russia sort of in its tracks. Everyone knows it's not true, but I mean, you know, it will serve a purpose. Alistair Crook, always a pleasure, my dear friend. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. Uh, Ray McGovern at 10 o'clock Eastern, Larry Johnson at 11 o'clock uh, Eastern, and maybe a surprise in the afternoon. Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom.